Hey, welcome everybody. So today we are very happy to have Maxi King, who will be telling us about exponentially small cosmological constants in string theory. I've asked Maxi to give us a pedagogical talk, uh, and uh, he will be here with us until Thursday. So if you want to talk to him, please talk to him, uh, learn about this interesting work. Uh, and we will uh, be going to dinner at uh, 6 30. We are meeting here in the lobby, so whoever wants to come, uh, please uh, feel free to join us. And please send me an email if you're coming so that I can make a reservation. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you, Juan. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. It's truly an honor to be here. So today I'll talk about exponentially small cosmological constants in string theory. This talk will be based mostly on the paper that I posted with my collaborators almost two years ago, and then many follow-ups that followed after that. So there is one question that's had, that has been bothering me so much for so many years. One lingering question is, we have this amazing theory of quantum gravity in string theory, but can you really confidently say that string theory populates a realistic universe? And if yes, where can we find them and how can we find them? And this is the question that I like to address here, although I'm not gonna address the question to, to the fullest detail, uh, to the fullest extent. And if you want to answer that kind of a question, there are a list of things that you want to accommodate in your string backup, so to say. First, size of your universe should be really big compared to the string scale, for example, because in, in our daily life, we don't see strings. And SUSY must be broken, and then CC must be positive. And also the standard model of particle physics must be realized in your solutions and the right cosmological history should also be engineered. And possibly there could be many more other things that you want to bake into your uh, solutions because there are certain things in phenomenology that we don't really know about. And the landscape is really vast and complicated. So to answer all, to have all those ingredients in one solution at once, to, to do that at one step is too complicated. So I'll take a step back by large and ask a simpler question. So the, so the question that I'd like to ask today is, is the following. Are there or are there not? Or the n equals one back of string theory, which are exponentially bigger than string scale. So phrased a bit differently, what I'm asking is, are there or the n equals one back of string theory, whose CC is exponentially smaller than the Planck scale? So I'll, I'll answer the, this question affirmatively, by actually scanning over millions of Calabria rent balls with complicated topology and explicitly computing the superpotential in every example. I really mean we explicitly computed the superpotential in every example, even for the examples that we did not report in our paper. And then using that, we'll find solutions with exponentially small superpotential, small string coupling, and large Einstein frame divisor volume. These will be solutions that are supersymmetric? Yes. It will be uh, supersymmetric ADS, yes. And we'll compute the Kelp potential inherited from N2 compactification string theory really precisely and to ensure the alpha prime corrections at the level of string tree level. And then we'll estimate the size of the Kelp potential, or corrections to the Kelp potential to provide strong evidence that our vacua are well controlled <laughs> the perturbative corrections. So let me take a moment to introduce my uh, collaborators, because the string landscape is so vast and complicated, we need to attack the landscape with multifaceted efforts. To do so, we need many people with diverse backgrounds and skill sets. So I want to introduce my collaborators. One is based at Cornell. Uh, here, my former PhD advisor, Liam and Mike and Jakob Moritz, Mehmet, Andres, Naomi Gendla, Andres Shakna, and Richard Daly. Uh, the other team is based at MIT. Here is Botella, Patrick Jefferson. Kobe B and Ataka. And I like to highlight those two people, Richard and Ataka, who are on the job market this year. So if you're looking for a great postdoc, you should consider them. And anyhow, let me move on. So this is the actual plan of the talk. I'll first give you a brief overview of the KKLT construction, not the full KKLT, including the Zeta, but I'll only focus on the ADS part of the KKLT. And then I'll give you the explicit constructions of or n equals one vector of the KKLT pipe. And by request, if I have more time, enough time, I'll comment on the recent paper by Harvard group that's challenging the KTLT snap. 
So let me give you a brief overview of the TKLT. So as I said, TKLT is, is the, full, uh, the, the full suit of uh, KKLT is to try to engineer digital-like solutions, but I'm not going to talk about digital today. I'm going to only talk about supersymmetric ABS. And KKLT starts with type to be compactification on a 307 or end core of a Calabria 34. Uh, then you can study the low energy effective supergravity and the low energy effective supergravity is for the N-course one SUVA with many moduli, including Keller moduli. And Keller moduli will show up many times throughout the talk today. They, you can think of them as some, some volume and volume of Einstein frame device volume, uh, sorry, Einstein frame divisor volumes in the Calabria. And whenever I say divisor, what I mean is a complex, uh, complex coding one surface. So real four dimensional surface in Calabria three folds. And when I'm talking about Calabria four fold and say divisor, it means a real six dimensional set manifold in a Calabria four fold. And there are complex structure moduli. They describe the shape of the Calabria. And then in Calabria threefold, they describe the volume of three cycles, real three-dimensional cycles in Calabria. And there is, of course, uh, one more modulus we see, which is exidolatin. You can think of that as a complexified one over G string. So the larger the power. And if you want to have a consistent compactification, there is uh, always a data that you need to really decide, which is the D-brain tackle, a uh, D-brain configuration, and the fluxes. So what you want to do is to engineer them such that the RR tuple is canceled globally. Given that, what KKLT tells you is that if you combine properly chosen quantized three form fluxes, such that the, the fluxes will stabilize complex structure moduli and the axisolatum at, at small flux potential, and also if you arrange the geometry such that the non-productive superpotential is generated, which depends on Keller moduli, then you can use those ingredients to stabilize all moduli. And the result is that the solution to the Afton equation will give you a supersymmetric ADS4 with large scale separation. And then if you are successfully stabilizing moduli, you will have large Einstein frame volume and small G-string. So the control is excellent. This is one slide summary of KKLT. So let me go through the KKLT in more detail. <laughs> what I'm going to assume is that all the seven brain stacks have SO8 gauge group. And then this assumption will be actually realized by, by an ex explicit engineering in real examples, in explicit examples. And what you can do is to turn on NSNS and RR tree form fluxes, and that will induce the so called Dukovapa within the flux superpotential that depends on complex structure moduli and the axolotl. Here, omega is the holomorphic tree form that depends on the complex structure moduli of the Clabial. And one thing that I really want to emphasize is that the flux superpotential is classically exact, it's not renormalized. So if you write down the superpotential, then perturbatively classical flux superpotential is the full answer. But there is, of course, the correction that you need to include, which is the non the superpotential. And I'll talk about the later. And as you can see, the flux potential depends on those moduli. So the flux superpotential will induce the potential energy for a complex structure and the exodilatin. And if you stabilize those, then you can fix the value of complex structure and the exodilatin. And uh, I'll, I'll just denote the vacuum expectation value of the, of the flux potential by W. So let's move on. So what happens generically, and this generosity assumption will be broken in explicit examples, so I'll have to do a few more things, but anyhow, for this slide, let's assume that this generosity assumption is uh, uh, held. You can expect that the complex structure moduli and the axial atom will have KK mass scale. And below that mass scale, what you can do is that say that there is a non-productive superpotential generated by some Euclidean D3 brains wrapped on some cycle divisor in a cloud report or a gauge a condensation on a D7 brain wrapped on a divisor, then you have this effective description of the subpotential. Here, A times E to the two pi minus two pi C T is the non protective subpotential that depends on Keller potential. And here I'm writing the tree level Keller potential for Keller potential. Then what you can do is to write down the Aston equation for the Keller potential line. And the conclusion that you can get by solving the Aftom equation is that uh, at the Aftom minimum, you have supersymmetric ADS. And provided that you are actually able to find small dot naught, Einstein frame divisor volume will be really large. 
and therefore the tree level approximation will be excellent. So this is the KKLP. So let me summarize again. If you want to find KKLT in explicit Kalabiyao classifications, there are certain things that you need to do, and those are the following. Say that you have an O3 O7 renthold of a Kalabiyao, then you want to have a properly chosen quantized tree form flux, such that the flux potential will be exponentially small. And you need to also arrange your, yes? Exponentially small in what? That will be more clear later in the talk, yes. And also, you need to engineer your geometry that sufficiently many times in the norm that the superpotential are generated to stabilize scalar moduli. And there is a solution to the after equation because having the superpotential does not guarantee that you will have a solution. So you need to actually find the solution to the after equation. And you also need to show that corrections to the tail potential are small. And I'll show you how you can actually realize that. And then I'll also explain what I mean by exponentially small. So let's go back to the flux potential. And uh, what I'll do is the following. What we know about the flux potential is that flux potential can be computed using the pre-potential of the parent theory, which is type to be complexification on a Calabria threefold. And there is a very special point in the complex structure moduli space, the so-called large complex structure point. And around that point, I can expand the flux potential into the polynomial part and into the instanton-like part. It's not really the instanton contributions, but I just abuse the language. So Z here is the volume of a curve in the mirror Calabria. And uh, what happens here is that, so you might be confused because I told you that the flux potential is classical and is not minimalized, but I have some exponentially suppressed terms. The reason why we're seeing such things, such confusing structures is just because I'm using a weird coordinate, the mirror coordinate, but that confusing choice will actually help us find exponentially for a small flux potential. So, and I need to answer two questions. How can we find exponentially small or not? And what do I really mean by exponentially small or not? So let me explain that. So an idea that you can employ to find small domino is to find a configuration where the polynomial part of the flux potential is vanishing along a flat valley of the atom solutions. Then the remaining terms in the flux potential are by design exponentially suppressed because they are they, they, they have the form like e to the two pi i zeta, where uh, z, where z is the complex structure which you are. So this is a fine idea, but you can say, well, isn't it a problematic because there are more equations than the number of variables. But in fact, what we realize is that there is a way to actually arrange that. The detail is in our paper, so you can look at the detail. But if I just summarize the result, what you can do is to choose the fluxes f and h such that the polynomial part of the flux of potential is homogeneous degree two polynomial with some extra condition here. And A and B are all uh, rational matrices. Then what you can possibly realize is that, okay, actually there is a family of solutions to those equations. And then the polynomial part of the flux potential will be just exactly that chain. And P here is a rational factor. And that's what I mean by exponentially small flux potential because the remaining term in the flux potential are indeed exponentially suppressed, assuming that you can have really the large complex structure, meaning Z is large. And uh, what you can do is again, to choose some good fluxes such that uh, two terms are leading and then the rest of the terms are suppressed compared to the two first two terms. And then you can stabilize the, the one flat direction, which I'm parameterizing using the exodolatum. And what you see here is that P1 and P2 are in the denominator, the difference of between P1 and P2 is in the denominator. So what happens is that if you align P1 and P2 such that they're really close, then you can make tau really big. And as a result, you can also make the flux potential really small. And one very important point that I want to emphasize is that because P is a rational vector, in fact, it is really possible to align them. And that will be 
the 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 key of the uh, story here. And one one comment that I want to make is that the instant on like flux super uh, instant on looking terms in the flux super potential looks really similar to the d minus one instant on super potential, but they are actually different. But I'll come back to it later because they'll uh, they, they'll play some some important issue. So I'm still not clear on this. Yes. Do or do not have a continuous one parameter family of solution is you very tau or z such that the approximation can be made better and better or not? So if you just take the approximate part, the polynomial part of the flux potential, then there is an exact continuous family of solutions to the upcoming equation. The, 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 sorry, I, I think I was a little fast. So what happens is that if you want to make your approximation better, then you need to con, uh, in, include the exponentially suppressed parts of the flux potential, and then they'll, in general, lift up all the remaining part. So in the exact setting, there is no a continuous family of solutions. <laughs> Different. So for fixed P1 and P2. Yes. The P1 and P2 are, are, are cannot be changed in continuous factor. Right? Oh, yeah. P1 and P2 are just determined by flux quanta, and they are not modular. OK, great. So they're fixed. Yes, P1 and, and P2 are fixed. What, what should I change in order to make the approximation better? Uh, you mean the approximation to this equation? Or well, whatever time. You, you had a super potential. That's right. Uh, you have the ellipsis there, which I assume. Yes. You know, phi oh, over. yes, yes, yes. Like, for example, P3 and P4 are much larger than P1 and P2. That kind of a thing is the, 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 the feature that you're looking for in your solutions. But of course, in our explicit constructions, uh, this is just to illustrate the point. But when we actually found the solutions, we actually included lots of lots of times in the super potential to really solve the Epton equation precisely. But yes, if you want just if you want to just keep two terms, then you want to require the P3, P4, and other terms are much, much suppressed when tau is large. The idea here is that you are doing a discrete tuning of these fluxes. That's right. Linear when P1 is close to P2. That's, that's, that's exactly the approximation right. yes. parameter. Yes. Maybe it's in that, then is it clear that the rest of the theory changes continuously as you tune P1 and P2? So I can keep P1 minus P2 to be very small. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to make it smaller, then P1 and P2 will be drastically different. And the spectrum of the theory will be completely different. Oh uh, yeah, if you choose different fluxes, then your theory will be completely different. And even right. if so you cannot use P1 minus P2 as some kind of an expansion parameter. Oh yeah, the expansion parameter is not really P1 minus P2. The expansion parameter here will be the value of the flux potential. And P1 and P2 will really sensitively depend on how much uh, the, the flux point. So what, what are you in the end of the day? What are you expanding? If I want to do if I want to do it better, mm -hmm. which parameter is going to be smaller or bigger? You want to have small W naught and you want to have large tap. Those are the two important parameters. Because W naught will in, in the end play some parameters that determines the Einstein frame. These are outputs of the computation. That's not an input. Yes, so unfortunately, there is no way that you can actually say, okay, if you choose flux this way, then your theory must be better. It's not really that easy. So what we had to do is to scan over many choices and then see what solution is a good solution. And in the polynomial constellation, you set up all the complex structures uh, stabilized? Oh, no. So, because there is a continuous family of solutions to the upcoming equation, that means that some complex structure moduli are massless. And typically, what, what we did was to look at solutions where only one complex, one linear combination of complex structure is massless at the level of polynomial. And then that will be lifted up by the instant like terms in the flux of potential. Okay, and do you have control of it? Uh, what, what well, the second step, which is to fix the. Uh, Yes, yes, yeah, because, because we know it, how to compute the flux of potential exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're asking whether or not we can compute this precisely. Or yeah, the stabilization of the left of the plot direction. Yes, yes. In fact, M here 
is computed by Gopakumabapa invariance and some flux quanta and some intersection methods of the Mirapapia, which we know how to compute. So we have a very good control. And if you really want, you can just compute the Picard Fuchs equations and find the exact solutions to do the same. But yeah, we have a very good control over the uh, flux of potential because that's purely classical. So let's say Grayson was to be similar to Martin in a sense because there is a flat direction. Yes. But then you want to. Yeah. Flat direction at the level of polynomial approximation, but because we have the exact almost exact knowledge of the flux of potential, we can include the exponentially suppressed terms, and then that we now have to do. And in these steps, uh, you have control of the platform equations that are satisfied? Oh, yes, of course, for sure. Well, to have a consistent uh, compactification, we had to saturate the tadpole either by space time filler heat three rings or the fluxes. We always did that, yes. The, mag the magnetic, right? Uh, uh, magnetic, the, sorry. The, 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 the fluxes are always positive. No? Is the same side. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, oh, F and H independently, they can have negative signs as well. But H wedge F, that has to be positive. Yes. So, and then this contribution will only depend on flux quanta, not H wedge F. So each term, each individual term can have negative sign, positive sign. So you don't use the uh, fluxes on the seven brains to have negative, to have negative contribution. Uh, the, 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 the seven brain, you said that you have groups, so, so it, this is thermal fluxes there, magnetic fluxes along yeah, the brain. Yes, we're not turning on any magnetic flux on the D7 brains, but we're using the induced D3 that D3 brain tapple due to the curvature correction to the D7 brain effect fraction. Yes. <laughs> Great. Is there any other question? If not, let me move on to the non productive superpotential. So let's talk about how you can generate or how you can guarantee that the non productive superpotential terms are generated. And those will be generated by either Euclidean D3 brains replant devices or gauging the condensations due to seven brains replant devices. A trick that I'll use, which is not really a trick, but the duality that I'll use is the FDU I'm left. So what I'm doing here is to construct an elliptic vibration of a Clavier free rent full compactification and go to F3. And then I'll take a pullback of D to D hat, which is devising the Clavier portal. And I'll consider Euclidean and bike grain wrapped on a device of D hat, not D, but they're dual to each other. So what happens is that uh, you can you can check whether or not the superpotential time is generated by checking the number of fermion zero modes on the effective theory of Euclidean and blind brain. And those zero modes are counted by the so-called bridge vector here that I'm writing. He had come out, he had. And the condition that I'll use to guarantee that the superpotential times are generated is by requiring that the H bullet, the Hooch vector is just one zero zero zero. What that basically means is that the Euclidean and five brain only has the universal fermion zero modes so that the superpotential will be generated. And uh, one, one parenthetical remark that I want to make is that uh, in Witten 96, the fermion zero mode counting was studied in the fluxless case. So you can complain that, oh, what if some flux will change, change the zero mode count? The nice thing about requiring the existence of the only universal zero mode is that, of course, some fluxes or the three brains will lift up some zero modes, but they'll not introduce new zero modes. So if there is a divisor that is formed to be rigid, by that I mean the divisor with only the universal zero mode, then they'll still have only the universal zero mode in the flux back here. So we can use the, the counting here. There was There is one problem, though. The problem is related to how we found exponentially small w naught. The, the problem is that there was a very light contact structure and that is light, as light as Kell moduli. So a, a reasonable worry that you can have is that what if the monophobian that I write here, AD, and that AD actually depends on complex structure moduli. <laughs> what if the dependence of AD on complex structure moduli is so strong so that the, the moduli stabilization is messed up or destabilized? So 
to make sure that that will not happen in the explicit constructions because we don't know how to compute the monofalcon explicitly at this point is to require some topological condition to make sure that the uh, complex structure dependence is as mild as possible. So here's what I'm gonna use. Uh, in, in a paper written by Witten in 96, show that the monofalcon is a section of a line bundle, a very special line bundle defined on the intermediate Jacobian, defined over the D hat. And if you, uh, the, the one of often is actually a section of that line bundle in the absence of space time filling D3 brains or M2 brains. So, what this means is that, okay, you can just require that the one of often is trivial, uh, almost trivial, by requiring that the intermediate Jacobian is trivial. And this is a cohomological constraint. And that should that should imply that uh, the the loosely speaking the the open string contributions from ED three to ED three and ED three to D seven will not give you any non trivial one of up independence. So if you ensure that the intermediate Jacobian is trivial, then this part will be trivial. Of course, there is one remaining part, which is the D three brain contribution to the one of up in. So let's talk about that. What happens is that, as, as was studied by many people, including Kanor and Juan here, is that the one of Fafian dependence due to the degree will induce some uh, distance dependent term. Here, the distance is the distance between ED3 and DP. And that's not actually destabilizing for string moduli stabilization. In fact, actually, you can just use it to stabilize if we bring position. And you can actually write down the FTM equation and FTM solution, and then you can show that actually. Yeah, they, they're not going to destabilize your Kelly moduli, but to make some people more happy, I'll also show you some flux factor with no space time D3 brains. But anyhow, this is a feature, not a bug. You can safely use it. And then if you really want to make sure that everything is fine, you can just compute the numerical metric of Calabria to show that D3 is stabilized somewhere far away from the Euclidean D3. <laughs> so, what do you want to do to guarantee that? The generation of enough terms of the potential uh, is, is happening. What you need to do is to compute the host diamond of devices in Claudia portfolios for billions of times. Of course, this computation is a very standard computation. You learn it from algebraic topology and rudimentary algebraic geometry. So if you're a professor, what you can do is to go to your student and ask them to do the uh, ex exact sequence computation for millions of devices. And uh, at the time of the publication, I was that student, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, I thought, OK, this is too much for me. So we need a better way to actually compute it for millions of times. So that's why I had to prove a combinatorial formula through a toric strat stratification to compute the Rouge diamond within a millisecond so that you can actually use that formula to scan over millions of caveats. And the original paper was posted in 2021, and there is one unpublished note and one other paper with Patrick Jefferson. So let me uh, go on about the non potential superpotential terms. Uh, at the time of the publication, there were two things that we're not really sure. One thing is the numerical value of the one of Basically, we didn't know how to compute the one of, uh, numerical value of the one of Papian. So what we had to do to make sure that the value of the one of Papian will not really change the story that we want to tell, we had to do a stress test by varying the value of the one of Papian from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 4. And then we didn't see any hint of uh, uh, moduli destabilization, for example. The reason why uh, we're kind of robust against the numerical value of the, uh, the one of Papian it's because the control parameter, when you write down the atomic equation, the control parameter is W0 divided by the one of Fabian. And let me remind you the W0 that we're talking about is like all the 10 to the minus 60 or 10 to the minus 100. They're much, much smaller than any reasonable value that you can think of for the one of Fabian. So that's the reason why we're kind of robust against the numerical value of the one of Fabian. But then now, now we know more about the value of the one of Fabian. Uh, in, in a recent paper that I posted with Sergey Artikan, Asher, and Bogdan, we computed the one of Fabian using string field theory. And uh, you can actually see that there is a reasonable field theoretical factor here, V0 
reduce uh, pump mass cubed divided by 16 pi square, and then there are some uh, stringy threshold corrections too. You mean you computed it numerically? Uh, no, no. Uh, we, so if you do the, say that you want to compute the on the property using CFT scattering amplitude, okay. then the, because the DNS turns have the zero modes, there is always the IR diversions. And then we regulated the IR diversions using string filter. But to really compute the, this, this factor, we need to do something more. So what we did in that paper was to just regulate the IR divergence to give you a meaningful numerical answer, numerical normalization. So you need to do more to actually compute the value of F, F1. So, so explain again why you have an infrared divergence. Yes. Uh, so let, let me write down some formula. So say that you want to compute the instanton, the instanton, then the, the diagram that you need to compute is following, and then let me compute the fermion mass matrix induced by the de-instanton superpotential. And this is the diagram that I need to consider. Let me explain what they mean, Oops. So this is the disk diagram, and then I'm inserting some vertex operator that corresponds to fermions. And then here is the, uh, the disk and the annulus, and the disk ends on the de-instanton, and at least one end on uh, the annulus or some a cylinder should end on the de instanton. Then what can be realize is okay, this thing is written as Fafian of the fermionic states on the cylinder divided by determinant. I'm forgetting like, whether or not there is one half, but anyhow, determinant of the bosonic modes. But then one, one thing that we're requiring is that this de instanton has four bosonic zero modes and two fermionic zero modes. It means that this is, in fact, written as zero divided by zero times some number. And then we want to rewrite this whole thing as d 4 x e square theta, and some other stuff. But then what is this numerical factor? That is the thing that we fixed. Uh, was, was it clear? Or is it related to the uh, uh, sense prescription? Yes, yes. A uh, sense prescription of fixing the normalization for like the instant tones or yes. Right. Okay, good. And uh, and actually we now know more about that because recently I proved that uh, the Bonafafian is computable by using the Portugal string theory, but I'm not going to talk more about that if you're interested. Uh, Please ask me questions later after the talk. And there is one other factor that we didn't know at the time of the publication, which is the D minus one instant and superpotential. The reason why you should be worried about such terms is because the D minus one superpotential looks like some of the Vafian times e to the pi a tau. And you expect that those will be generated in general in the flux factor. The problem is the flux superpotential that we wrote down has roughly the same form. And I told you, we cannot, we, we didn't know how to compute A, B minus one at the time. So if P1 and P2, let's say, are com comparable to one half or bigger than one half, then we're screwed because we don't know how to uh, compute the D minus one. That's why at the time of the publication, we had to make sure that we're choosing flux factor with P1 and P2 being much smaller than one half. Uh, and but it was really good that we we're being really careful. But shortly after the publication, uh, I I proved that actually, if all the seven ring gauge groups are SOA, then actually there is no d minus one instant and super potential. So it was good that we we're being careful. But now we can go beyond that. For <coughs> P one and P two again. Yes, P one and P two are made of uh, some intersection numbers of the mirror carbial. And, and the flux constant. Are they integers or rational? Yes. So this potential is not invariant of reducing tau by one. Uh, by one. Yeah, they are not invariant. And what does this reflect? Because that's, should this full theory be invariant or not? Uh, can you say that again? Should the full theory be invariant? On the, is tau normalized such that the full theory is invariant on the tau? Yes, the full theory should be invariant under the SL2Z, I expect, but 
The reason why we're seeing some rational P and tau is because tau is now parametrizing some, some direction in the contact structure moduli. So in fact, although I wrote it as tau, they are really contact structure. Um, but this complex structure, is, it, is tau the same as tau plus one or not? I don't think they will be the same because the phase will be used. If you just look at the port voltage. Is P, so if P1 and P2 are the same structure that we used before. Yes, yes. So you're saying that the D minus one that's the potential competes with the, uh, should be included normally in the- Yes, that's the worry. Case. Yeah. In the, in the complex structure. Yes, that's the worry because, uh, so what we played, the game that we play is to range the flux potential such that the flux potential is exponentially suppressed and they look awfully similar to D minus one. And then if, if you have P1 and P2 that are, that are com comparable to one half or one or bigger than one half, then you need to include them to really have a meaningful answer for your flux back here. But as a matter of principle, there's an additional constant that normally should include in the the, the non this potential, yes. Yeah, yeah usually. Yes, yes. But then, yeah, we wanted to avoid a case where we had to compute those because we didn't have, we didn't know how to compute those, but now we, yes. I, I just got slightly confused. I thought the proposition you briefly described here would compute the WD minus one there. Oh, great point. So that, that paper actually happened after the publication of this uh, small cosmological constant. And then there is one more subtlety when we computed that using string field theory, we actually looked at the fluxless factor. And the non-trivial part about D minus one instanton is that they're expected to generate in non-trivial flux vacuum. And in non-trivial flux vac vacuum, we don't really know how to do the CFT computation. So that computation is not really applicable for D minus one. So I had to use a different uh, way to compute D minus one. But anyhow, that happened after the publication. See, I have a naive question. So the book of buffer with into the potential. Yes. Does not have any D minus one contribution. In type to be that's right. But then the, the non-trivial thing is that if you compute the hook of buffer with into potential in F theory using the full uh, complex structure dependence, even on the elliptic vibration, that should contain the D minus one. Is that the contradiction? Or? Oh no, no, actually, that's just, that is why there is no D minus one. So actually. What I did in, in this paper was to, because the F theory flux superpotential should in principle contain the group of upper Witten superpotential, uh, the D minus one superpotential. If you show that the F theory group of upper Witten is exactly the same as type three group of upper Witten, you show in addition, uh, you, what, you sh what you're showing is that there is no D minus one. And actually that's what I showed. Does it have to be in principle there is the D minus one? There is in principle D minus one, but what I proved is that if you want to have a D minus one super potential, then we need to have a non trivial seven brain configuration where the axial gelatin is actually wrong. But let's see that if there had been a D minus one, there would be something wrong with the book, yeah. book, of, book of Baha with the super potential. Didn't they just argue that this was exact? Oh, that, that was argued in type uh, in F theory or M theory. But then the type three group of Baha with the super potential is obtained by just doing the dimensional reduction. Of the closed string part, but the group of Buffalo's potential of F theory in, prin in principle should also contain like seven brain contributions and D minus one contribution. But the, the flux of potential I wrote down is just obtained by just dimensional reduction of type to be action. So, are there any uh, Calabi-Alton in which there's a D minus one superpotential? Yes, if you just take a random Calabi of four poles, that is elliptic vibration, and then compute the Google bubble with super potential, and then you take the same limit, then usually you see the minus one super potential. And then the result is that after going after taking the same limit, the FD group of upper with super potential is split into three parts: one, type to be Google bubble with two, the seven brain super potential, three, the minus one. And that happens generically. Type to be doesn't give you the full answer. Type to be the correct. Yes, uh, the, the close. It, no, no, no. I, I should say it more carefully. The type to be flux of potential will give you the full the, the flux of potential. But what we usually oftentimes omit is the correction from the, the super potential contribution from the seven brains. But if you include the seven brain contribution, then it will give you the complete third picture. 
So yes. that's that without without the seven brains. Yes, if you if you if you have the seven brain, brain configuration such that the exoskeleton is not running, then the the Kukov buffer returns potential that you drive by just doing the dimensional reduction of pi to be actually will be exact. But that would be. <laughs> Uh, but the moment C3. Oh, great. C3 is the thing that we're explicitly including, and D1 cannot contribute due to the holomorphy. So, in, in type 3 with the 307 planes, um, the holomorphic coordinates are device volumes or x to the left turn. That's why D1 instant turns and D5 instant turns and S5 instant turns cannot contribute to the superpotential, but they will appear in the calculation. Great. So let me see. So there is a super potential that is more general than the book of Rafa with uh, and uh, it's known somehow. Yes, so F theory Google Papa Witten is okay, it's the sum of yes, type to be Google Papa Witten plus type to be D7 plus type to be D minus. And then typically people just write down this because this contribution is vanishing when all the seven brains have SOA gauge groups, but then still you can have the D minus one contribution, but what I showed is that that is also absent. It's hard to believe there isn't the general form of a single D minus one brain or a general cardio. It must be a very general formula. Yes. So my device space is the cardio itself. So you're integrating something when you cardio. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're interested in, but it must obviously it's going to turn out to be something simple and universal. Yes. Uh, you know what it is? Uh, well, I, I can give you two answers. One thing is that the, the D minus one instant term has too many zero modes when you don't have a flux. So the, to say that, uh, by saying that, what I mean is that the D minus one instant term zero modes will be lifted when you have some non trivial flux. And that's what makes it really difficult to actually count the zero modes exactly. But you can use supergravity super gravity approximation to count the zero modes uh, of the D minus one that we know. Um, but perhaps you're saying that without a super, without a flux, there's no WD minus one. That's correct. Yes. That's more succinct. Yes. Okay, good. Then let me uh, move on to the solution of the after equation. So the effective theory that we have is the following. We have the superpotential, the sum of W0 and the number of the superpotentials due to D3, DD3, and the genetic condensations on D7. And K I write is the tree-level killer potential. And here is a very non-trivial part. Uh, actually, I was really worried about that when, when we were working on it. Uh, the the clavias that we're playing with have tons and tons of a kilo moduli, like roughly all the 100 kilo moduli. The, the problem with that is that the number of geometric phases grows exponentially in H11. And the number of phases that you can actually solve the aptum equation in it is not really growing that fast. Let me give you the flavor here. So uh, this is the 2D cross section of the calico, so to speak. And then each dot here is a different geometric phase. And a striking thing is that uh, the original picture has like 200 megabytes, size is 200 megabytes. So I didn't want to put that on my sponge. So I had to reduce the size by a lot. Still, you see gazillions of phases. And then you need to navigate through those phases to find the solution. And then naively thinking that's really difficult, but my excellent, my amazing collaborators found an algorithm, optimization algorithm to actually get you to a phase where you can solve the afternoon equations. With the superpotential you computed. So, with that, we actually found the solutions to the FTM equations. And that brings me to examples. I'm going to show you two examples. The first one is in our paper. So, this is just some toric data of the Club Yao. It has 113 kilo moduli and five complex structure moduli. And the flux at the D3 brain tuple is saturated by adding some flux quanta and the space time to the D3 brains. Uh, quite nicely, there were just one more superpotential term, which has uh, almost trivial Gauge diamond, and all seven brains have SOA gauge groups. And uh, 
the flux superpotential was 10 to the minus 62, string coupling was 0 0.01, the string frame coupling volume was almost a thousand, Einstein frame coupling volume is even bigger because the string frame, uh, the string coupling is small. And the, the magnitude of the CC is even smaller than that of our universe, which is quite nice. And the volumes of, let's say, all two cycles also small. I think to get back to it later. Yes, actually, there, are, there were some sort of large. Yeah. The, the, Q3, the Q3 platform, the total should not be 16 or 20. The total is 60, yes. The total is 60, which is saturated by any. 60. Yes, yeah, 60. 16. I don't know how you. Pardon? The total should not be uh, oriented. Yes, oriented. Or 16. 60. Let me give you why you can expect that number. So the flux, the tackle is roughly the, the even by, this is a rough counting. The, the fixed point, uh, the Euler characteristic of the fixed point in the red form divided by four. I think I could be screwing up some numerical factors here, but this is rough, rough scaling. And then what we have here is that uh, chi f is almost 200, 200 something. So if you divide it by four, you, you get some right order. Uh, the other solution is here. In this case, we don't have any space time filling the three ring. And this is the toric data of the Clavial. We have 200 kilo moduli, four complex structure moduli. And nicely, we have 216 times in the potential with trivial intermediate Jacobian. And in this case, we have a rather larger value of W0, but still, the CC is really tiny. So, we have found solutions by using some optimization algorithms. Now, the tricky part, I, I want to talk about the corrections to the telepotential and control of the alpha prime and G string corrections. And this also uh, answer, this will also answer your question about whether or not some two cycle volumes are there. So it looks all good because we have- So, so far, let me just make yes. sure I understand. So the, the previous discussion so far- Yes. Was about finding solutions for the- Complex structure and, uh, and the Kellogg yes, and the and the development, actually development and complex structure. That, that was this. Uh, the complex structure part was the W not part was the complex structure ah, part. Okay, so you, you found the solution for every everything. Yes, so, that's okay, right. Okay, sorry. I, yes, because here we explicitly made, uh, computed or or guaranteed the generation of the non the okay. potentials that depend on Kellogg. And then we went through bazillions of metric phases to actually find the and solutions for every job. So it looks good, I believe, because we have small G-string, large Einstein frame device volume. But there is one uh, big issue, which is that G-string scales as one of our log of W0, and the Einstein frame device volume scales as log of W0. What that means is that some cycles will inevitably have order one volume in a string frame. And this should worry you. And we're also really worried about this, this fact because I thought, and many of us thought, and all of us thought that maybe alpha prime corrections will throw our solutions away and then we'll have to go back and uh, just forget about these solutions. But there is a reason why we still posted the paper. And so I want to explain why we still did that because I, we thought, okay, Although it looks really awful, actually the control is good. Let me go through some non productive corrections to the Kellogg potential first, and then I'll go to uh, talk about the productive corrections. So, obviously, Euclidean D ring uh, corrections to the Kellogg potential are suppressed because they depend on Einstein frame device volume, let's say, for example. Or if you have D1 ring, you have still uh, order of one over G string suppression. For the similar reason, the NS5 brains uh, are even more suppressed because there is one over G string square in the exponent. So those are negligible. The worrisome thing is the following. There are, those, there are Walsh instant corrections to the cal potential, and those only depend on string frame curve volume. They're not suppressed by one over G string. So those are the 
steroid vaccines. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you some computations that could possibly convince you that actually the corrections from those Wall Street instantons are not really severe. And then, of course, I'll get back to the potential corrections. So let me explain this slide. The Wall Street instanton corrections to the potential at the leading order in G string are arising from the string tree level. And the string tree level diagrams can be computed exactly because they are inherited from N2 convectification, the parent convectification. And then you can just use mirror symmetry to compute the Wall Street instant corrections to your Kell potential. Of course, you can say that, OK, you have 100 moduli or 200 moduli. How do you realistically use mirror symmetry to really compute, let's say, Gopakuma Hoffman variants? It was a very computationally challenging problem. But recently, we made a very impressive computational progress to actually compute the Gupta Kuma Hoffa invariance in every club. Yeah, you can actually use your computer, download your download your code, and then click a few enters. Then you can actually compute Gupta Kuma Hoffa invariance of almost any club yeah, in the Koisa Sakaka database. And using that, what we have done is to include all the small curves to compute the alpha prime corrections from those curves and then explicitly use them to evaluate our Keller potential and solve the outcome equations. Then the objection you can have is that, OK, you included all the small curves, but how do you make sure that the, the corrections will not diverge as you go deep into the more economy? That's why we had to choose some uh, number of random rays, like 1,000 random rays in the Morricon, where the Morricon is a cone of the curve. And then we went really deep into the Morricon. And then this is the result. Uh, this is basically the Gupta Kuma Vafa invariance that's counting the number of curves, and then the, the, the exponential suppression factor coming from the volume of the curve. And then we computed the, the, the log or the value of them as we increase the degree, and then you can see they are decaying really fast. So we didn't see any hint of the diverging uh, corrections, and then from that computation, we concluded that actually we're in within the radius of the conversions. Is that because e to the minus two pi is 10 to the minus three? Uh, e to the minus two pi. Two ten yes. to the minus three. <laughs> you can say that. Yes. Oh, it's a physical thing. Yes, uh, yes. It's because pi is big. It's uh, right, right. Yeah, it's maths go e like one over r and the size of the exponential effect goes like e to the minus two pi r. That's right, that's right. But then the non-trivial thing that I at least I didn't know beforehand is that Gopa Kumov up invariance or the number of curves also grows exponentially as you go, as you increase the degree. So the thing that we're worried about is whether or not the growth of the Gopa Kumov up invariance will weak. That's why we had to actually compute the Gopa Kumov up invariance. So what I say is that we have demonstrated via explicit computations that the control of the alpha prime corrections at the level of string tree level is excellent. And as I said, this computation relied on the uh, fact that the leading Kell potential can be computed by N2 supersymmetry, which you can compute using your symmetry. But there, there are things that I have not told you about yet, which is the genuine loop correction to the Kell potential. So let's talk about that. And before you go on to that, just, uh, just a zero throw question. You'd have to have like 100% correction to the Kell potential to like screw up your picture, right? So, so you have to do a big problem in order because the W is breaking the, is the only thing breaking the R symmetry. So you really just have to worry whether you're destabilizing the presence of. I mean, order twenty percent correction would be okay. Really, you're that's, that's that's like exactly one hundred percent. Yes, yes. So actually, that's the point that I want to illustrate uh, in a few slides. So I'll actually do that. Thank you for asking great questions. That's actually a very crucial point. Yeah. So what I say is that we have a very good control over the tree level Kell potential and the, the living corrections that you're, you should be worried about are coming from some open streams extended between space-time D brains or some cross gaps. And a very nice thing is that uh, the one corrections are suppressed by the 4D Billiton. And I define 4D Billiton as e to the 2 phi which is equal to the Pandy Billiton square G string square divided by string frame Calabia volume. And then I'm going to parameterize my ignorance by delta K because the one correction should be suppressed by G string divided by Calabia volume. I can just uh, take out some something that I don't know and then write it as delta K. And I want to ask, 
how severe the correction that I should expect for my solutions to be destabilized. So in the similar way, I'll, I'll use delta t to parameterize my ignorance on the shifted value of the Kalamush y. And as, as, as Nima said, the Afton potential, the actual value of the Afton potential is indeed shifted, but that is shifted by this amount. Because we know how to compute the super potential almost exactly, the only unknown thing is in the cal potential, and it is in the exponent. So if you do the tail expansion, this is the form of that. So, and similarly, you can compute delta t. Uh, I, I won't go into the detail about how you can compute it. It's actually a very simple algebra. Delta t is given by that. So now the question that you like to ask is, how much is the shift of delta t? So let me estimate the size of it. And to do that, I'm going to use a very simple model, a one parameter model of Keller module. And if you use that, then do some algebra, you get this formula. And then the, the punchline here, oops, that's not the punchline. The punchline here is that if you actually plug in the actual value that we found in our back here, delta t over t is 10 to the minus seven times delta k. So if you want to argue that the solution that we found are destabilized, you need to explain why delta k can be as large as 10 to the seven. And this is a very extreme conspiracy theory, if, you, if you're uh, willing to say that. Of course, we don't really know how to compute delta k t precisely. So, and, and this is a logical possibility that we cannot really rule out yet, whether or not delta k t can be as big as 10, 10 to the seven. Uh, but quite timely, recently I, I made some progress on computing delta k in Calabria rank amplification. So let's try to use that result to estimate the size of it. Yes. For your second example, uh, yes. the we now was not as small. Yeah. What, what would be the number? I didn't really uh, compute it, but I expect that that thing should be still very small because of this equation. So uh, if I just rewrite the uh, log of W0 in a different way, then this will be g-string square divided by string frame Clavier volume. G-string was roughly 0 0.1, Clavier volume was 1,000. So there is 10 to the minus 5 factor. And then log of W0 is going to be like uh, 10 or 10 to the 2. So there is some factor like 10 to the minus 3 or 4 in front of delta k. So it really depends on what kinds of vector you have but I haven't done the computation for that example. So say that you want to compute the Kellogg potential, the correction to the Kellogg potential. What should, you, what should you do? The Kellogg potential that we're talking about is actually the Kellogg potential in Einstein frame, not in string frame. So if you want to compute the Kellogg potential in Einstein frame, there are two things at least we need to compute. One is the string one correction to the Einstein Hilbert action in string frame, the other one is the string one correction to the calimetric in string frame. And then you can combine those results to get the string one correction to the Kellogg potential in Einstein frame. And the re result is basically given as that. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the formula here, you can possibly reasonable, a reasonable guess you can have is that delta K should be uh, of the order as delta, oops, delta K should be as, uh, the order of delta k should be around k naught, which is the tree level Kellogg potential times delta e. And what I computed is delta e. So let's use that to estimate the size. So what I'm writing here is the, the one correction to the Einstein Hilbert action from annuli between, extended between space time film d brains. I want to highlight a very nice numerical factor here, one over two to the 10 times pi square. And uh, t is the usual open string modulus. And here I have t over t square, and that will be very important. And the trace is taken over the Ramon sector for the internal part of the CFP. And n plus minus is the number of BPS and anti-BPS states. The nice thing is that due to the measure, there is no IR divergence. And you can possibly say that, what about the UV divergence? But of course, UV divergence will be canceled if you sum up all the diagrams, and they'll be canceled by due to the pole cancellation. And let me uh, show you this formula again. 
Dolphin appears to be really suppressed because of this amazing numerical prefect. Huh? And then if you really want to argue that delta k should be that big, you need to explain how delta e should be as large as like 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 9 because of this additional suppression coming from the k, k0. So it's not really likely to be the case that delta k could be that large, but we can do a little bit more by just considering one irreducible representation and restricting the interval from one to infinity to, to just focus on the IR contribution. And this is the result. You again, you, you see that the, as you increase H, which is the weight, the, the, the contribution decays exponentially and then zeta is defined as two to the 10 times pi squared times delta E. So if you have almost a messless representation, irreducible representation, that will only give you like one over thousand, let's say. And then even for the delta T to be order one, you need almost a thousand massless states almost. It's your decision whether or not to believe that that's gonna happen. But I don't think that's quite likely to happen. Of course, it'd be very informative to compute the on the correction to the Kell potential explicitly. I just started working on it, but there are many confusing things. So if you're interested, let's have a chat. I think this is a very interesting problem. But then, yeah, let, let me summarize. So we have constructed a very large class of KTLT like ADS vector with exponential scale separation. And the exponentially small CC is coming from the exponentially small value of the flux potential. And G string is small, Einstein frame device volume is large, and the control of the alpha prime and G string expansion appears to be great. And uh, the last part of the talk, if you allow me to talk about it, is the comment on the recent paper by Harvard group, because some people were asking if I could talk about it. So I'll, I'll do it. So what they did is as follows. What they did was to consider an M theory version of KTLT, not the type to be version. And then say that you did all, all of the things that I told you really successfully. And say that you did that. Then what you will have is ADS3 compact, uh, ADS3, specimetric ADS3 with large scale separation in M theory compactification. And then we believe that that should have a CFT dual with, with large C. That is believable and convincing, but then Harvard paper and that are used the following day. So there is a domain wall that is separating a flux vacuum and fluxless configuration. I wouldn't necessarily call that a vacuum, but anyhow, there is a domain wall given by M5 grain wrapped on a cycle gamma that is dual to the flux. What the Harvard paper argues or conjecture is that the dual CFT of the whole ref, uh, of the ADS3 with large scale separation should arise as the IR CFT of the M5 grain theory. I don't know why that has to be the true case, but anyhow, they conjecture it. And they, what they argue in addition to it is that because the M5 frame must be supersymmetric, the reason why they say that is because the IR CFT is supersymmetric, the UV theory should also be supersymmetric. And they argue that gamma has to be a special Lagrangian cycle, which I wrote it as slab. This is a four cycle in the complex four. That's, that's correct, yes. So then they were just doing two dimensions where they want to get the CFT theory. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. And then what they argue is that the IR CFT should have small central charge and the flux of potential cannot be small. Therefore, KTLT with scale separation cannot ever happen. That's the entirety of their argument. Of course, in our construction, gamma is not slack and W0 is small. So something must be going on, <laughs> going wrong in one of those two sides. So what I'd like to say is that as a logical statement, if the claim of the Harvard paper is correct, then KKLT is wrong and our solution is wrong. Conversely, if the KKLT scenario is correct, where it works, or if our construction is correct, then the claim of the Harvard paper cannot be correct. It's a logical statement. And I want to highlight two sentences in Harvard paper. Let me read it out loud for you. However, the difficult task to compute the complete superpotential and Kell potential including the Kell moduli dependence has not been achieved. And they go, in other words, suitable corrections to the superpotential depending 
in particular on Kelo moduli, which is hoped to lead to a supersymmetric vacuum will not materialize. So why did they say that? <clears throat> the reason why they said that is not because they found some errors in our computations, but I want to emphasize it really strongly, but rather the above counterfactual claims are made because if their conjecture is correct, then something must have gone wrong in our computations. We asked them to point out some errors in our computations, they didn't respond. But what I want to stress here again is that we have carefully and explicitly computed superpotential and the Kelly potential. Our vector have been tested with unprecedented precision that had never happened in the literature of string vectification. And if they just complained about the Kelly potential, that, that could have been more reasonable in my opinion. So I'm forced to consider the following logical possibilities. There are three possibilities that I view. One, the conjecture by the Harvard paper is wrong. Uh, of course, they could be right, but that is a possibility. Two, there is a fundamental flow in the existing theory of the superpotential or the fermion zero accounting of Euclidean and phi frames. And the computation that we carried out to count the fermion zero mode is also wrong. That, that implies that there is a literature on the fermion zero accounting in plots factor. Then if this, for this possibility to be true, it must point to a perennial error that exists in the literature. But I don't think that is quite likely to be the case. But anyhow, this, this is also a logical possibility. The other possibility is that the loop corrections to the potential are surprisingly big and it will destabilize everything that looks like a job team. But although this is the only could have been fatal weakness of our vector at the point at the time of the publication, for this to happen, you need to explain why delta k could be as big as 10 to the 7. But the computation is in our favor, I say. Of course, the complete computation is not done yet. We're still working on it. And if you have a good idea, or if you are interested in this kind of a competition, let's have a chat. So this brings me to the conclusion. We have presented extremely detailed constructions of TTLT like supersymmetric ABS vacuum. Our vacua are really unrealistic. I'm not claiming that we have a realistic vacuum, but they could be used as stepping stones towards more realistic vacuum. And we are uh, Continuing effort, we have gained more and more understanding of the string landscape. And as, as a final remark, we're really trying hard to find this direction. Thank you. Yes. Can you comment also on the, the so called tadpole context? Yes. Yes. The, so let me tell you what the tadpole conjecture. As, as written in the literature says, the Tepo conjecture basically says that uh, in large number, in the limit where the complex structure, number of complex structure moduli is parametrically large, the, the, the conjecture says that the number of uh, flux quanta that is required to stabilize the complex structure moduli is roughly one fourth or one third of the number of complex structure moduli. Therefore, it will be very difficult to stabilize complex structure moduli. I don't know if that is true, but it is true that it is really difficult to stabilize complex structure moduli if you have many moduli, but I don't see why that must be tied with the, the path pool. But that's, I, I just say that it is a difficult problem. Uh, the, the constructions that I presented to you today have a small number of complex structure moduli ranging from four to seven. So it's not really, uh, uh, I couldn't really claim that this is the counterexample to the path pool conjecture, for example because we're not at a parametrically large number of uh, complex structure of moduli space. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Basically, well, I don't know. Um, I don't know too much about it, but the, the way you constructed it, does it help you identify what 3D CFT would be? The... That, that is an excellent question. <laughs> Then you're going to do the bootstrap people and then, okay, does it exit or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's an amazing question. I, I really like that question. Like, I really think we need to figure out the CFP dual to really show 
whether or not the solutions that we found exist in, in reality. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the, the central charge is really big. And I can tell you some low-lying states, and I can tell you some OPs of low-lying states, but that's all I can tell you. And that the reason why I can tell you is because I can use super approximation to compute some scattering amplitudes and compute some mass, but that's all I can do. For <laughs> it's not like an equals four or AVJM where you can like from the even construct your read of the yeah theory. yeah not that I know. I'm not mistaken. There was a paper I think by Conlon that saying that this. Uh, States had integer dimensions. Oh, that is for the large volume scenario. Uh, something that, yes. Okay. For KTLT like scenario, like then the scaling dimension is not really more integers. You said low line, but in actual it's a very high dimension. Uh, the the high. It, you mean like are you since you make the cosmological constant small? Yes, I thought you only have super gravity. Yes, at low line. That's right. Yes, yes. So when you said low line, like the, the, the yeah mass of moduli, let's say yeah, there's those low lines. Yes. Is this something that's really settleable by calculation? Because I mean, you 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 still are sort of hunting around to find these uh, exceptional things. And so if you believe there's some deep reason, then you'll believe that indeed it'll turn out that there is a large correction and it looks like it's a conspiracy, but there's some deep reason it has to happen. There's some rule that says something was always going to add up to something positive. And if you're hunting around to, to uh, make some contribution big or small, there's got to be something else that's counterbalanced. For example, I'm just saying that, that given that it's not generic, yes. Uh, it, how do you know that uh, is it actually settleable by a calculation? Uh, I keep on going and saying, look how crazy it would have to be uh, for this correction to be so big. But I'm sure they'll come back and say, uh, yes, it must be that big. And <laughs> crazy you have to work to find this uh, uh, extremely small CC. That's a great question. I think the, the way, a very productive way to settle the debates, which I, in my opinion has been really unproductive in many regards, is to actually compute the loop corrections and then compute the corrections coming from the fluxes. And then I don't think it's such an impossible task to do. And then if you can just compute the corrections and then make sure that those are small in explicit examples, then what is there to left to debate about? So I think that's the way to go. You calculate one loop, and they'll say, "Well, maybe you have two loops." I mean, that, 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 so uh, yeah, that's, that's so, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about a, a sort of a game. I'm, I'm, it's really a question. Is it since it's not parametric? That's right. And and it's uh, done. Then how is it possible to conceptually settle? <sighs> conceptually settling this issue will be maybe the way that uh, Gustavo asked about. If you can find CFT by the means of, say, booster. I don't know how to do that, but that will be a proof. So if you're asking for a proof, I think like CFT techniques might really give us some proof. I don't know how to prove such things using string wall sheet or super graph. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Yes. Okay, so is there, is there any way to prove that formulation to compute all those like loop questions that you mentioned? Because I would think that you only have uh, like basically super description uh, better than even like say where she CFT to formulate all the uh, unambiguous you know, string amplitude yes. and all loops and so on. Uh, that's a great question. So at least the corrections that are coming from space-time filling debris, I think we can just use the watch CFT in the fluxless background. But the problem is always what happens if you consider the flux background and do they give you a sizable correction? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult issue. But I think if I'm not mistaken, some string field theory people have been working really hard to have a reasonable description of the RR background. So possibly there might be a way. Uh, yeah, actually I wrote that picture. But oh, okay. But I, I think, yeah, in our approach, we are able to tackle only like, uh, uh, like tiny R boxes. So yes. if you're just considering R boxes as a prototype correction to the uh, string field vacuum. Uh, but I think in your case, you really had some, you know, yeah, all the one the R boxes. Yeah, yes, yes. Boxes. So, yeah. That's a great question. I don't really have a good answer now, but I think we should have, we should try to have a better understanding of string theory or string field theory in the flux background in general to really do such computations, but I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. 
Well, um, I remind you that there is a dinner at, uh, we are meeting here at 6.30. If you want to come, send me an email. And uh, let's thank Mike again.